Okay, so there's three objectives uh, up here, and then I do hope to accomplish one other objective also. Um, so the, the three that are, that are up here, we want to describe a model of the nucleus, or of the atom really, that features a small nucleus surrounded by electrons. Uh, we want to outline some of the evidence that supports that nuclear model of the atom. Yeah. And then we want to outline at least one limitation of that model. So topic seven, right, I guess we haven't really talked about it yet, uh, is our first jump into nuclear physics. Right? So it's the kind of smallest scale that we've dealt with anything yet. Uh, I happen to like topic seven a lot. Um, I like talking and thinking about protons and neutrons and some of the seemingly weird things um, that are involved with protons and neutrons being jammed really close together and electrons being quite far away in many cases from them. Uh, I, I happen to enjoy this topic a lot. Now the one thing I will be honest with you up front is topic seven is not that long. The topic eight is really long. And historically, we only have a topic seven test in marking period three, right? So we did have like a beefy quiz today. I think it was about 25 points. I'll do some sort of large-ish quiz um, towards the end of the marking period, but this will be our only like big test. So maybe more so than usual, you might want to like not let, let yourself get behind. If you do start to develop some problems, you know you want to address them sooner rather than later. Uh, and then I already gave you the medical isotope project rubric, so there's no reason you can't um, get a very large start on those. Uh, all right, so all of our objectives today, except for the ones I didn't really have up there, uh, involve a nuclear model of an atom, right? So we often depict atoms as being this relatively small nucleus, and then we have these electrons that kind of orbit around the nucleus. And, and that actually is exactly what our nuclear model says. The only kind of discrepancy with the way that this is often depicted is the relative size of the nucleus uh, is tiny. It's real time. And if we were depicting an atom that was this, you know, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters across, I couldn't draw the nucleus small enough to really truly depict how small it is, right? Even if I had a nucleus that was the size of this, if I had an atom that was the size of this whole whiteboard, a dot would still be too big for the nucleus, right? So the, the nuclear model is, we do have this nucleus in the middle, electrons outside, but the, the nucleus is teeny, teeny, tiny, tiny. All right, but we want to spend most of today outlining um, why we think we know that that is what atoms really look like, and then, um, in particular, one of the experiments that gave us that evidence. So we've only had this nuclear model for, oh, probably a little more than 100 years. Uh, we already know that we've only known about the, or deduced the electron a little more than 100 years ago. Well, this work was happening at the same time. Um, prior to this nuclear model, we didn't envision atoms as being mostly empty space, right? And what I said, the whole whiteboard is the atom and the nucleus is this tiny thing that we can't even see in the center, and the electrons are even smaller and outside, right? That is a major point of the nuclear model, that most of the atom is empty space. Prior to the nuclear model, most scientists envision the atom as being this like positively charged thing that had some negative charges like sprinkled in some of the places. Right? So it was, almost all of that space was positively charged, and then there were some negative spot regions of that. So they called that the plum pudding model. I've never heard of plum pudding outside of physics, but probably wherever these physicists were, that was a local delicacy. Um, but what I think it's supposed to mean is that like the pudding is this positive, like the, the, it's like a bowl of pudding, right? It's all positive, char positive charge, but then there's like plums like mixed in, and the plums would be the negative pieces, right? Um, so I don't know. Um, so that was the leading model of the structure of an atom before we had this nuclear model. And again, this current nuclear model, so here's what I was trying to depict before. We have this nucleus in the center, which is positively charged, and then we have these electrons whizzing around the nucleus, and those are negatively charged. This is a better than average depiction of the nuclear model. Sometimes we draw all of the electrons kind of orbiting in the same way, kind of like the planets orbit the sun, and that's bad, right? This is better. 
showing that the electrons uh, do orbit in, in every different plane. So what the heck is, is our evidence? Um, if uh, you did some nuclear stuff in chemistry, right? You did like decay, create it. So in chemistry, you probably heard of something called the Rutherford gold foil experiment. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Well, we don't call it that. In, in IB, it's not just in physics. IB doesn't call it that for some reason, all right? So but let, let, let's talk about Rutherford for a moment. So Rutherford was a physicist, I believe, at the University of Manchester. So that's in, like, the UK. Um, and he was from New Zealand. And he's given credit for this experiment that, that deduced the nuclear model of the atom. But really, it wasn't Rutherford that did it. It was, like, two of his graduate students, right, Geiger and Marsden. You may have heard of Geiger because there's like a thing called the Geiger counter, right? That detects radiation. Um, but Geiger and Marsden actually, you know, were doing this experiment. Rutherford was like their advisor, and, and for some reason in the U.S. we give him credit. Maybe it was like a colonial thing that we liked that he was from New Zealand. We didn't like Britain at the time. I'm not sure. I mean, this is way after the Revolutionary War. Maybe we, we held a grudge for you know, longer than we realized. Um, so the geiger marsden experiment is the same thing as the Rutherford gold foil experiment. And it's, it's correctly named, right? These guys shot stuff at gold foil. Right? They shot alpha particles at gold foil. Now, we've run into alpha particles before. Right? So an alpha particle is the same thing as a helium nucleus. So the alpha particle is tiny. Right, helium is one of the smallest atoms, and it's the nucleus of one of the smallest atoms. Um, so it's tiny, and it is charged, because this, hel this alpha particle, this helium nucleus, is two protons and two neutrons. Right? And then no electrons. It's just, it's just the nucleus. Right? So no, no electrons at all. So two protons, two electrons, so it is positively charged. All right, so they shot these really tiny, positively charged things at, at gold foil. Now, I have a number of different images of the results of this experiment. Um, there is an, an applet that you could go to here if you remain unhappy about this explanation over the next few minutes. And then at the end, I have a, a, narrated, uh, a narrated animation as well. Now, I'm just going to skip this one entirely because it, it doesn't show up well. All right, so here we have the gold foil, right? So each of these, like, circles is supposed to represent a gold atom, and then these grossly oversized dots are supposed to represent the nucleus of those gold atoms. And then in this diagram, we're shooting the alpha particles, like, this way, at the gold foil from, from this direction. And as this uh, schematic shows, most of the alpha particles did what? They went clean through. Right? They went clean through. And this is probably a slight underestimation um, of the number of atoms across that the gold foil had. This shows about six atoms across. It's probably more like maybe 20. Right? So very thin. Right? That's why they use gold, because gold is super valuable. And you could bang it super, super, super thin with like almost no technology whatsoever. So this alpha particle went straight through because it didn't come close enough to the positively charged regions of those atoms to, to feel a repulsion, or to feel a big enough repulsion to change its trajectory. All right? So it went straight through. Right? And then the electric probably encountered some electrons, but the electrons also are tiny. Right? So they're not taking up much space. Uh, the electrons aren't staying in the same spot. So we're not really seeing any influence from attraction from the electrons. We could see influence of repulsion from nuclei. But this one didn't come close enough, so it went straight through. This one looks like it went straight through. This one looks like it went straight through. Both of these ones look like they went straight through. This one came close enough to the nucleus of this gold atom that it had a deflection. All right? So this one continued through, but, but it had a direction that was a little weird. Um, this one went straight through, this one went straight through, this one went straight through, and almost made it all the way through, but came too close to this nucleus on the far side and kind of got deflected up the other way. Okay, straight through, straight through, straight, oh, not straight through. This one almost direct hit against the nucleus. So this one 
was so close to almost having a direct hit that it had a super strong repulsion that, that made it go back in the direction that it came from. And then out of these ones, there's only one other one that had a deflection. Now, I have some more to say about this, but, but if this one had aimed dead center at this nucleus, would it have hit the nucleus, you think? I agree with those of you that are nodding no. No. That repulsion is so severe that it would accelerate so strongly in the opposite direction that it would lose its rightward velocity before it struck. Right? It would turn back around without ever touching the nucleus. Um, but this one wasn't quite, a, 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 it wouldn't have been a dead hit anyway. It was a little, little off. So the result of this experiment was that most, like the 95%, 98% of the alpha particles went straight through. A few got deflected. They still went through, but they got deflected. And a very, very, very few actually came back in the same direction they were fired from. All right? So this was not what was expected from this experiment. Remember, they were operating with this plum pudding model. Right? The fact that almost all of these went straight through told us that all of the, the positive charge of an atom was located in a teeny, 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 teeny volume of space compared to the total volume of the atom. So hold on, I see you, Patrick, hold on. So again, one of the major outcomes was that all of the positive charge is relegated to a very small fraction of the volume of the atom, um, and then most of the atom is empty space, all right? So there's a huge, like, just totally um, physics-shifting results from this experiment. Uh, Patrick? So did they think that like, most of the alpha particles would be repelled and then like, a few would be kind of like... Uh, right. Practical. So what were they... So if the plum, plum pudding model was correct, like, what would they have seen? Uh, I think about that a lot. And to me, I would think that if this whole thing, even if it's only 20 atoms thick, is positively charged, I would think that they're all going to turn around. However, however, if you look at the narrated applet that I have in a few slides, I believe it shows all of the alpha particles going through. And it looks like Matt has an explanation for that. I have an idea. I didn't have an explanation. I'm just going to ask. Well, let, let me finish that. So the only thing I could think, Patrick, that would make that result so the whole thing's positive charge, but they go through, is then the positive charge would be pretty diluted. Right? It's not that concentrated. So maybe it's just not severe enough to, to turn any of these alpha particles around. My head wants to make them all get repelled if we have a sheet of positive charge. Matt, go ahead. I was just wondering, does anybody know what their actual hypothesis was? Oh, I'm sure. I don't know. But yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, like Wikipedia will tell you that in like five seconds. Uh, yeah, Drew. Ah, how do they know that they went through? So this whole, um, let me, now I'll probably have technological difficulties. Uh, in the first applet that I have, I think both of them maybe, it kind of shows it. So this is not a huge piece of gold foil, but right? they have an alpha emitter which is firing alpha particles at this pretty small piece of gold. And this whole setup is like encapsulated in, in like a circle, right? And on the outside of that circle, so, so like over here and up here, well, really, and over here. Um, this whole circle is lined with the material that gives off a tiny bit of light if an alpha particle hits it. So they know where the alpha particles hit because a tiny amount of a flash of light would come from that spot. Uh, yeah, that's a, a great, great question. There's one other hand, uh, or two other, Jake first. If the alpha particle is so small, I don't know how big would the flash light be? Would be unable well, how large in volume or how bright? If you can, I mean, if it's bright, if it's a lot of energy, you can see a very small point of light. But I don't, I don't know. Um, I um, oh, but if, if the way you're saying it, they're yeah. all going to repel. Does that mean fire any? That, that would imply that fire any positive thing, any other thing will always repel because that the gold foil yeah, isn't charged. The gold foil is correct. There's no net charge, right? Yeah. But so if the plum pudding model is yeah. true, the way you're thinking of it, it yeah. means that every time you fire a positive charge of anything, it always repels the object, which. Right. right. So, so, so maybe, and, and I, I don't care to spend a ton of time uh, looking at the the pumping model, but, but 
if I have an alpha particle, if it's not hitting one of the plums, then it's going to do what I'm saying. Yeah. Then in my brain, it's going to it's going to behave like the, the way that I'm thinking about. It. But you're right. The, the gold does have no net charge, right? So then, what the heck happens if the alpha particle hits, hits the negative spot? Well, maybe it would just neutralize it, and that one wouldn't get through. I don't. I don't. I don't. Um, all right. So that that's the Geiger margin experiment. Let's look at one other view now. I don't like this one as much because I think that the relative repulsions are, are off. But um, it's showing the same thing. So here we have a single gold atom, right? This alpha particle actually would have hit, if there's no repulsion, it hits the nucleus. But there is a strong enough repulsion that gets kicked back this way. This one probably, if there were no repulsion, would, would go just barely past without hitting it. So it gets deflected, but it doesn't get so um, deflected that it comes back the same way. My problem begins here. I think that this alpha particle isn't close enough to the nucleus to have that severe of a repulsion. But whatever. What this is trying to show is as the alpha particle like crosses further and further away from the nucleus, the repulsion is less. I really think by the time we get like this far away, though, you, you wouldn't see um, a deflection at all. Yeah, Jordan. Large hadron collider, like are they moving that fast that they can come into contact, or is it? Like so in the large hadron collider, um, they're they're using solitary protons and not alpha particles, wow. but that's a vacuum. They've evacuated all of the matter from that thing. So the only thing they're interacting with is the other protons that are circling the collider in the other direction. But you're right. I mean, it's really rare. I mean, they're using large amounts of protons. But it's pretty rare that they get a direct hit because of this repulsion, right? Because the protons go in the one way, are repelled by the ones going the other way. But yeah, they're going like 99.99999% of the speed of light. I might might be one more or one less nine up than I said. Um, so what? So this is an extremely important experiment. Every single IB exam that I've seen has asked some question about it, and the questions usually aren't that hard, right? Um, but really important, and if you didn't read the three sections I asked you to read about, um, you know, I think you should. And if you don't like this, then go ahead and look at this narrated animation and play around with the applet earlier on. Um, I do want to just spend like, like 30 seconds um, on our third objective, which was to outline one limitation of this simple nuclear model of the atom. Um, I don't like this objective. I wish Ivy would just say, hey, the nuclear model doesn't tell us everything. Um, here's what it ignores. They don't do that. But anyway, what I can come up with for limitations are, um, so we have these electrons that are sort of in orbit around our nuclei. Um, please excuse the interruption. I'd like to remind all students that ride a bus to please remind bus drivers that we are off on Monday. Many schools have taken Monday back as a day on, and we are not doing that. We are closed on Monday, so please remind bus drivers that there will be no transportation needed on Monday. I don't get to say it again. Thank you, and have a great three-day weekend. See you next week. All right. So one thing that isn't accounted for under this nuclear model is the electrons can give off energy. And we're going to hopefully spend two minutes looking at that today, and then you'll hear some more on Wednesday. But electrons can give off energy, and if they're giving off energy, that means they're left with less energy, and then they should be closer to the nucleus after, you know, as a result of that. And if they keep doing that, then eventually they kind of spiral into the nucleus, and that can happen, but it's very uncommon. So the nuclear model can't be complete, because if it was, if it was just simply that these electrons are in simple orbits around the nucleus, um, we probably couldn't have anything more complicated than, than a hydrogen atom, that would be problematic. Um, protons are positively charged. We're saying that gold, anybody know how many protons gold has? Or its atomic numbers? I gave you periodic tables. We well, don't, don't even bother. It's got at least 30, right? At least, probably 50, 40, 46, something. 46, fine. Uh, 46 protons. 70. Uh, whatever. Let's just go with 30. Somebody has 30 protons. I don't know who it is. 30 protons jammed into a ridiculously small region of space, a nucleus, that's problematic if those protons are all repelling each other. So the simple nuclear model doesn't explain that, at least not by itself. Uh, and then there's another problem that, you know, 
different atoms of the same element can have different masses. The nuclear model doesn't conflict with that, but it, it doesn't help us understand. All right, we have about four and a half minutes. What I'd like to do, and I think this will only take two minutes, is just look at something that I'll be explaining more on Wednesday. So if you would, please meet me in the back of the room. I'll do my best to not end class, to go ahead and end class before the bell rings. Sorry, Amanda, you're not going to see this.